Okay, hi, I am Brian Cardell. I am a developer advocate at Agalia. And I'm Eric Meyer, also a developer advocate at Agalia. And today we have uh, two special guests. Do you want to introduce yourselves? Go on, Surma, you go first. I go first? Okay, hi. Yeah. I'm Surma. I, uh, I'm an engineer at Shopify. I'm Jake Archibald, also an engineer at Shopify. Um, but folks might have known me, and probably and Surma as well, for the, the time we did as developer advocates on on chrome but that 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 time has passed i think uh i don't know that i have ever acknowledged this like very publicly but i almost certainly would not be a developer advocate if it were not for jake uh oh thank you i don't so jake actually it was a compliment even when i (laughs) commiserations even when i switched on my first day uh, Jake had a like one-on-one call with me, um, to just, you know, like help me out was really super gracious about it. But, um, yeah, anyway, like even the very first time I spoke, I was like super, super nervous and Jake was there and he and Paul Irish totally got me through that. So, um, yeah. And you were great as well. That's some strong mentors to have. One of the things that you both did there was HTTP 203. Uh, which is mm. like my favorite podcast. I loved ab- about it a lot of the things that are hard to put into words. Uh, I know that I was listening to it before Surma was there when it was Paul Lewis. And oh yeah, that guy. I will I will admit Surma that I was a little bit like they switched Darren's on Bewitched or something. I was like, what are you doing? But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I came to really like having Surma on there, and now. You two are a little bit like I was trying to think before this about who I should choose of all the, but it's a little bit like Matt Damon and Ben Affleck, where like you were oh. in one hit and now you leave and go somewhere else and you're in another hit. So you started a new <laughs> a new podcast. Yeah, that's it. And if if someone leaves Shopify, then I'll just follow him around. Like I I've just I just you know picking where to work is. Oh, it's too much effort. So I'll just do what Soma does. I mean, he, he picks good places, so I'll just keep doing that. Hey, if you got a system that works. Exactly. <laughs> I will say that the podcast is one of those things which I think Jake and I would be doing even if there was no one listening because it's genuinely fun. It was one of the few things where there was almost no alternative motivation or incentive was needed for us to keep doing it. And that's really It's nice. two white guys in the pub having a chat and yeah. like, do you know what? Do you know what? It's wasted that no one else is listening to this. <laughs> I I said that actually on, on Twitter a few times that I used to save your podcast for Saturday when I could just like go out on my deck and like get a beer and listen to it because it felt like that. You know, it felt like, man, you make sound, uh, podcast sound really good. It's pretty cool. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, there are... Uh, very few podcasts where you get a lot of good technical stuff, but also just a lot of fun banter and stories about Jake's cats or looking desperately for a bathroom or something like that. Good stuff. It's a staple. Household staple. A whole meme throughout the series. But yeah, like, uh, well, we left Google. They wouldn't let us keep the name, which is like, well, whatever. Um, so we basically started the same thing again, but called it off the main thread. So, I kind of was hoping you would do 302 because it made sense, right? Like, Right. Uh, <laughs> we did discuss multiple status codes, but it turns out that Google has a lot of money and a lot of really good lawyers, yeah, and sure. <laughs> it just wasn't worth the risk. They're bigger than us. <laughs> so you did, uh, you've did. you done two episodes that I've heard now. Uh, well, I guess there's three because there's like a secret third episode that wasn't the launching one. Changing jobs, Dino, yeah. and optimizing animations. Yeah, this yeah, is, that's oh, the yeah, one. Yeah. So yeah, it's uh, off the main thread. Uh, also, OTMT. Um, I was wondering which one I should look for, but I guess off the main thread is what you look for in the podcasting services. Yeah, we maybe need to think about our SEO there. We hadn't even thought about that. But the first episode you did is kind of like two parts, two major parts, and the second part you did this thing that was like browsers are sort of like political parties, users are like voters. You got into a a talk about what are those ideologies, like they have ideologies and then they change over time, like the the origin window shifts around. I think it was really, really good. And um, do you want somebody to try to briefly sum up the premise, the high high points? Uh, Yeah, I can 
I can take it. I mean, it was it was a slightly wonky metaphor, but I don't know. It fits in some ways. The the, the idea is that you know the browsers are like political parties, and users are like voters. And the more users a browser has, uh, the the more power it can wield in 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 other areas. Um, and you can like equally question whether the way they get their votes is fair or are they doing it the right way like um i think the comparison i made is is like well you know everywhere you go on google if you're not using chrome it tells you to use chrome um if you're using ios you are a safari voter whether you like it or not like you know you appear on all of the stats as a safari user because you have literally uh, no other choice in terms of browser engine so you know like, um yeah, a little bit similar to parties the uh, political parties you can sort of question their ethics uh in terms of getting votes um but yeah you have places like the w3c where the laws are passed and the parties have to work together um but also uh their ideologies are different and change over time and that was kind of the premise of the section of, of like looking back at when uh chrome was sort of heavily pursuing low level stuff uh safari less so uh firefox pursuing low level stuff because of Firefox OS. Uh, and over time, uh, we saw Safari start to pick up more of the, the low level stuff. Chrome start to pick up a lot more of the sort of high level CSS stuff and uh, Firefox kind of uh, becoming less of a Chrome ally, which it was in the past and more of a Safari ally um, due to the, the privacy focus and the focus away from Firefox OS. That's kind of the very quick story. Um, but I think the part of it that you're particularly interested in was this, the, the extensible web manifesto, which is something a lot of browser engineers at the time kind of agreed with, um, that, that there should be more of an effort to look at lower level parts, like building blocks that we can give developers. So, you know, to kind of admit that, hey, you know, browser engineers are not web developers. So rather than try and create pre-baked solutions to do one specific thing, there should be tools which allow you to create things that the creator of the standard didn't possibly, you know, dream of. Like they, you know, it's a whole creativity that is that is released out there um, rather than just having a, a CSS property to create a reflection. You know, you'll have the tools to create your own reflection, but also other kinds of reflections and other kinds of, uh, you know, uh, graphics work, that kind of thing. Um, and how we sort of hear less and less about that these days, but also how it maybe wasn't quite capitalized on um, back in the day. I, I like the thing about like the votes and all analogies are sort of like leaky abstractions. So oh, absolutely. I don't like I don't want to go too deep into that I guess but it's sort of that and also sort of like uh you can compare it to anything else where there's a few major players and you have here like Firefox being more like the kingmaker than an actual right they're never <laughs> going to be the king but they're the ones that have the the little bit extra room to throw around and I think the point that you made is like, then they had a little bit more weight than now, but it's still really relevant. I also was thinking after this, that like, I think Sermon raised the question. It was like, do real people choose the browser? You know, mm. like, are they really voting? Well, absolutely. And, and, and I guess, you know, in some ways I would say the, in that way, the metaphor kind of holds in the same way, like a p political party will say, it's like, you know, you should not vote for them because they're evil and you should vote for us because we're going to make everything better. And like, you know, largely that isn't always true. Um, in fact, sometimes yeah. the party that is more successful at persuasion is the one that is, uh, you know, maybe playing a little bit loose with the truth. I don't know. It, it, in the same way, you could say, are people <laughs> really voting? <laughs> for right. you know the parties for the right reason but yes like you know they'll see when they go and google search hey you should be using chrome or you know when when they go if they're in edge and they go to download chrome there'll be a banner across the top saying hey do you really want to do this so yeah i, I they're gonna they're persuading you to become a voter you might not really realize what you're letting yourself in for 
But it is an interesting yeah. thought that the WebKit engineers are going to claim WebKit has this many million users per day, for example, because on iOS, even if you install Chrome, it's it's WebKit, while Chrome at the same time will claim to have this many million users per day. And for them, the same users probably count into their stats as well, because it's like a very technical niche difference that to the outside is probably indistinguishable. And I'm not sure that just having a user base is enough to claim ownership of the web platform, but it's just interesting to think about that these stats that are probably going to be thrown around and I don't know, maybe in advertising, it could convince a non-technical user to switch from one browser to the other. I don't, I don't know, but you know, there's probably effects to being able to inflate your user base and use that publicly. These stats can be twisted as well, right? So when of course. Internet Explorer, I'm going to say nine came out, you know, they had this great SVG implementation. And so they would build a lot of demos around performance that involved a lot of SVG because the engines in the other browsers were, were less good at SVG. Um, but what we saw is like a, one particular benchmark. I think it was even the, the big one that they were pushing forward um, where like Edge was so much better than the other browsers. What they'd done is they'd added in a blur 0 0.001 pixel filter. And that threw every other browser onto this excruciatingly slow path, but not them. It wasn't needed for the visual output, but boy, did it make the stats look good for IE. And, you know, political parties do this stuff as well. Yeah, and it's not the first time or the last time, I think, that a browser maker has creatively addressed uh, benchmarks or creatively created their own benchmarks in mm. order to look better than everyone else. And so there, there's actually a term for that. And it is bench marketing there we go oh very good brilliant yeah but there's a question that i want to put forth you know i'm brian and i certainly have opinions about this but i'm interested in hearing yours why is it such a big deal for browsers to have the most users or whatever like what is it that they're particularly pursuing in trying to dominate a market or have the most users or whatever i mean that I, I think that's different for every browser right they for google as far as I'm aware, it's, well, you know, Google has to give a lot of money to Apple for getting them to use Google search, right? For Google Chrome browser users on other, well, particularly on like Mac OS, they don't have to pay that if it's, if they're using it in Chrome and it can be used obviously to get people more into the Google ecosystem. So I always stayed away from this side of Google and tried to convince myself that I was being paid by Google to work on the web. Um, so, you know, I sort of almost pretended I wasn't a Google employee in some ways. I was just, uh, you know, working for, for the web via Chrome. But yeah, so there's some of the, the details of that kind of funding. Um, I never felt particularly affected by, and I'm not 100% sure of them, but I, I'm pretty sure that's it. And so for Safari, I'm not sure what their interest is in, in a larger user base. Um, for Firefox, it, again, it's it's revenue, right? Like the more users they've got, the more they can charge for using Google search uh, and the company stays alive, right? It could lead to an identity crisis for me when I was thinking about like, what am I even being paid for at Google? Because, you know, the web is open. It's not a platform that's specifically owned by any individual company or any individual person. Chrome is free. And I was paid to make people build more websites, basically. I mean, I don't know if that's an accurate job description, but it felt like it. Mm. And that seems like a very indirect way to benefit Google. I mean, you know, I think everybody knows Google is an advertising company and most of the revenue comes from ads on the web. But man, that sounds still a couple of degrees of freedom away from make the web better and help people build more websites. So it's, yeah, I, I think I was in a similar campus, Jake, where I was like, I you know, didn't ask a lot of questions because I got to help people build better stuff and push the web forward. And I genuinely thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, do, you ever, do you ever feel like it sort of sounds like as an excuse, like, you know, no, we, we, we just, we just made the uniforms for the bad guys. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, and, and I do want to stress that the other side of that is like I never felt like I had to do something that was against what I wanted for the web as well, mm -hmm. and I was I felt free to actively push back on, you know, things that I didn't like so much. Like you know, I was never a big fan of AMP, and internally there, there were specs that were created. Certainly, when I was part of the service worker working group, there were specs and features that I shut down 
for privacy reasons. So mm. it would have been great for the ads folks, which, you know, you could say would be maybe good for Google, but I felt empowered to say no. So your answers on why do browser makers care so much about whether they're the biggest, I mean, it really comes back to something that Brian and I have opinions on, which is the fact that the entire browser ecosystem is effectively run by Google ad revenue. Google wants more users so they can make more ad revenue. Mm -hmm. Mozilla wants more users so they can have more revenue from Google, paying them to have Google as a default search so that Google can have more ad revenue. And probably WebKit is, I mean, Apple as well. Apple, of course, has more money than God, but at the same time, a you know, multi-billion dollar a year payment from Google, that's hard to say, yeah, we don't care. Yeah, and, and they have things pulling them the other way as well. And I, I think people overplay this a bit, but I'm sure it's true to some degree that you know Apple makes a lot of money from app store revenue and a all-powerful web that means you don't need an app store would at some point become a bit of a drag on that mm -hmm. funding. I don't think as many decisions are made based on that as people make out, but I also don't think it's, I, I'm sure it registers to some degree. Yeah, I think that's the challenge in a lot of these things is that there's like a lot of, you know, Kremlinology that happens, people talking about like all of the things at play. There's a group of sinister guys in a smoky room somewhere <laughs> pulling all the strings. But I mean, anybody who's ever operated in most businesses knows like they can barely get a lot of things done. They're not definitely doing that. Yeah. Um, e even yeah. less believable when that's politicians. Yeah, so I, I think I agree with you that like it's not the major thing that people think it is with either Apple or Google, the App Store revenue, in exactly the way that it's portrayed. But it's also not nothing because, you know, both those companies have different factions with different budgets. And that is a very simple and basic way that that plays out. So in your sort of like ghost of Christmas past, you said um, it's like Safari was kind of against the extensible web manifesto. I never really felt that way. Like it's hard to say because they can't talk about it openly, mm. but certainly their engineers cited it in a few cases. But I know that like in, you know, proposals, uh, there were people who uh, like occasionally would say like this proposal is sort of in line with this bit of the extensible web manifesto. And I guess, you know, if that's a popular thing that people cite, you would understand why you'd want to, but also definitely a bunch of other people were also critical and I, I too am critical, but anyway, I was just curious, like, was there like a thing that made you feel that or is just that made me feel that Safari was against the yeah, yeah. Extensible web manifesto. Part of it would be through my work on the Service Worker Working Group. Hmm. Apple folks were in the room relatively from the start and hmm. contributing to, to meetings, but it did feel a lot like there was a, uh, you know, initially quite a bit of pushback away from like the idea of it being a, a, a worker and like, is there a more declarative solution? Yeah, um, right. Uh, and one of the things we did actually agree on at the time is that we will need something more declarative to, to mm -hmm. avoid having to spin up the worker um, for performance reasons. And that's, I got frustrated at, at Google because it, like, they sort of dropped the ball on that. And, and they, they are doing it now, but uh, it took a while. But yeah, it's, it, other than that, it's things like um, all of the dash WebKit, dash CSS properties that seem to be doing one little thing that that they needed in in quartz you know in in, in the mm. os like a reflection because that was part of apple's design language strongly at the time yeah and then things like index db just being left to rot you know like this thing had dreadful bugs and they were left there for years right it made index db unusable and and i felt this for a t like before i joined Google, you know, I was the like, index TV was the thing I needed to use for particular projects, but I just couldn't, uh, not, not while it making it also a, a project that would be compatible with Safari because it was just too buggy there. And, and I think, you know, I mean, obviously bugs exist, right? Like we, we all, we all create bugs, but it, it was more the, the reaction of like, just not really bothering to fix them. It, it just didn't seem to get any priority at all. I, so I was in the CSS working group for a while, I got into that because I was working on, on Houdini, 
trying to get Houdini started, really. And again, like Safari and Apple was part of that from the very beginning. And they are always quite excitable for ideas that make the web more polished visually. And so mm -hmm. they were really into Houdini on a conceptual level. But I also had a similar experience where it felt like they sometimes came into these discussions with a solution in mind that they weren't allowed to talk about and were just mm -hmm. kind of like trying to push the discussion to stumble onto the thing that they internally had already agreed on. I don't know if that's the truth, but that's sometimes what it felt like. And part of the symptoms there is they were always going for something declarative and didn't like the idea of imperatives API because they're, I guess, it's not like that they're disagreeing with a extensible web manifesto per se, but they definitely seem to take more of a, we want to guarantee that the things developers build perform well or look good. And they would rather constrain it so that there's no bad cases rather than, you know, giving developers yeah. users and letting them run with it. And I think that sometimes was it, what was the tension I noticed. So there is definitely, I feel, a philosophical difference in how Safari or Apple engineers approach the web platform and what should be added in you know the standards world here and how people like Jake and I tend to think about it. Yeah. The other thing that I wanted to mention is um, Safari is the one that gave us Canvas, which is one of the few mm. really low-level things that we had um, before the extensible web manifesto. So I totally agree that it's more, it's like, it's more nuanced than, than that. And that Safari's particular nuance was more toward like, yes, but we really prefer the high level things <laughs> and like, let's. Yeah. So Canvas is an interesting one. Cause it, I, and I think that when I was talking about, you know, Ghosts of Christmas Past, like here's what Safari used to be like. Canvas predates that time zone, I, that, that period of time I was looking at because Canvas was before Chrome, right? Before Chrome was released. Right. But it also fits into something else I mentioned, which is they a, a lot of, and, and again, because of how you don't always get like full information coming out of uh, Safari Fox because of Apple's sort of attitude to information. You know, the big thing we would hear is is that like, it wasn't when web developers were asking for stuff. It was when a, another internal team at Apple asked for something. That's mm. kind of when it really got done. And I definitely heard that about Canvas. Like this, this was like, this came from um, the web view stuff, the, the use of, of WebKit within Mac OS or OS X at the time. Um, like they wanted a 2D graphics API. So essentially the 2D graphics API from Quartz was taken and just thrown onto the web. But you're right. It is it is a low level, relatively low level system. Yeah. So, I I think the trouble is that the extensible web manifesto is a pretty short document. It's like it's very short. It's trying to be such a fundamental thing that it begs a lot of interpretation <laughs> and follow up. And I think it's also has to be remembered that it was written at a point in time. So it's a reaction to the web of a decade ago not the web of today. Like if you read it today, it you would probably read it differently in a lot of ways. Um, so the web had been almost entirely high level, like really high level stuff, right? There were only a few really low level things. Like we had the DOM, we had these mutable prototypes in JavaScript and like that's kind of it. <laughs> like we just happened to have also XML HTTP request. But everything that was good that was happening on the web that we were doing was figuring things out and rapidly experimenting and doing all these really interesting things, you know, doing polyfills and stuff. And so, you know, like a lot of the conversations there were like, shouldn't it be like Surma said at a later point, like it's almost like tech debt, this new navigation API that we have today, it's not even really the same thing, but it fills a need that previously gives you like a holistic view. And um, also you had said, Jake, about page transitions, like why am I ripping all this stuff out and reinventing it when the browser knows <laughs> this stuff already? And yeah, like that's what the extensible web manifesto was also trying to say is like, wouldn't it be great if we had the, this layered platform? And at the time, it was like prioritize those low level things, like excavating the low level things to give us more parts to work with. 
Um, so the the navigation API is an interesting one because it, it it's a little lower level than the history API, a little, not a lot. I think the reason we needed the navigation API is that the history API was just bad. Yeah, yeah, really. It's it, it and it wasn't fixable. Um, it it didn't integrate. It was kind of it was designed by one guy, right? Like you know, Hixie did great work on loads of the HTML spec, but there was a couple of um, a couple of bits that weren't great, and uh, the history API was one, and the app cache was the other. But yeah, it so the navigation API is still rel- still feels kind of high level, but it, it gives you some more insight into the, the history system. But you can still use it without doing that, you know, if you, if you don't need it. Uh, probably the biggest flex we did from high level to low level w- was app cache down to service worker. And yeah, when people say like service worker is hard to use, it's that, well, yeah, we've we've let you write code in the middle of the fetch process. And that mm-hmm. fetch process wasn't even spec'd. Uh, it was spec'd as part of the service worker effort. And, you know, it had to be spec'd in a way of like, essentially just saying what browsers do, which of course wasn't entirely compatible, but then sort of like, you know, trying to get the browsers to to meet in the middle, uh, you know, and, and carve a path that, that worked. So yeah, like to use service workers effectively, you are sort of, you know, need to understand large parts of fetch. Um, and it is one of those examples where I think we should have built up much quicker on that into into sort of higher level systems because we've had time to observe now the kinds of things developers use it for. So we, yeah, we should we should be making that simpler. So you know, have a look at the patterns, okay, pave the cow paths, as they say. Yeah, this was supposed to be the idea. The extensible web manifesto is that we, you you could create we called them polyfills at the time, but speculative polyfills. The tag renamed them to, um, mm. where you know, like that's a much easier proposition, right? Like hey, everybody says that they have this problem. You're all using JavaScript libraries and things to solve them now. Here's one that just emulates what we're thinking. (laughs) Go try it. Uh, Because you can do that, right? Like you can go try it in the project where you're having pain right now. And you can let us know without like trying to participate in the standards lifecycle, which can take, I mean, it's not short, right? We've had a, a bunch of shows like uh, Inert and Focus Visible. We had a show with Rob and Alice after that launched, and we were like looking back at the notes, and we were like, "Holy, it, that took seven years! It's amazing. Uh, nobody has time for that. Like, people are worried about the project they're shipping next month. You know, like it's tricky. How do we get people involved? And I, I would like if we could find better ways to study that. I also pitched a thing on that to OpenUI. Maybe we can include a link to that. But I think we need ways to study that. And we have almost some of the tools that you need, like the HTTP archive. Uh, we've done a lot since 2015 to improve like the information gathering there. But it's also not perfect. And there's good developer surveys now. I know that's something that like the folks at Google were involved in. And I know like, I think the other browsers were involved to some degree as well of, of like, going out and, and properly surveying developers and asking them where the pain points are. And I, I was really happy to see that because I I felt like easy, even as a DevRel working for a browser that folks weren't really listening to, to what me and the other DevRels were saying and, and instead were placing much more weight on what our particular team at Airbnb or Facebook were saying, even though we, you know, we had a pretty big hunch that it didn't represent developers at large. Uh, uh, yeah. So I think these surveys are, are a good way of, it's not involving people in the standards process, but it's, it's listening to developers better. I think the survey, you're, like there are a lot of surveys, but there's like the MDN developer survey. Uh, that was a huge, huge one. It had a lot of sort of rigor that is actually a thing that spawned interop and the WebDX mm. community group. And Eric and I are involved in both of those. I don't know if you have anything you want to say about those, Eric. Yeah, I mean, I still, I miss the days when it was a smaller field and you could sort of ask everybody, (laughs) but Mm. those days are long behind us and are not coming back. Um, I just, things like the the dev survey, like any survey, it's dependent on who you can reach. Mm. And are we reaching a representative enough sample of the industry 
that we're getting good signals there? And also, are we reaching the parts of the industry that are not what we would might think of as a representative sample? Like how many dev survey results are we getting from China or India, which are enormous markets or Africa, anywhere in Africa? Well, Eric, so I, I mean, I got to know you without you knowing me first through, uh, you know, your, your work and articles and all, all of your CSS stuff. But like we first met, I think, well, in certainly in the web web conference world. Um, and I spoke at uh, Event Apart uh, a couple of times. And it, mm-hmm. and I think one of the things that that event did a good job of is, is reaching those developers that weren't being, like, they weren't actively discussing web dev on Twitter, you know, they weren't actively um, working on side projects on GitHub and exploring the latest frameworks and that kind of thing. And I think that's, whenever I think of the developers that aren't being reached um, by some of these surveys or by, you know, someone like me when I was DevRel, I I just felt like it was a total like blind spot was that, that group of developers that, and that must be, I, I don't know, I wouldn't like to put a figure on it, but I'm sure that's a huge percentage of the web developer community if you got us all into one room. Uh, you also mentioned um, Firefox's shift and Firefox OS, and you said Firefox OS is dead. But what the interesting thing that I wanted to add to that is like, it seems like a whole lot of things happened at like Mozilla Labs, and this is almost like Bell Labs, where like their things weren't successful, but then they went and inspired things that became reasonably successful. So I think KaiOS is still a thing now, right? And they're hmm. actually have some business as far as I know. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, I guess I guess I meant dead in terms of like it's not it's not directing Firefox's strategy in, in the way that maybe it used to. And also Servo is now in the Linux Foundation. And I know because Egalia this year is doing a lot of work on it. Well, last year was doing a lot of work on it. And this year, hopefully we can continue doing work on it. But as you said, it's only possible because we are funded by a super diverse group of people who have some kind of interest in something on one of the web engines. And I mean, I think that's really cool. So what, what is Servo's position in, in like the web development landscape? Like when it first came out, it sort of felt like they're rewriting Firefox. And then it sort of felt like they took some of the things they learned from it and put it into Firefox. Um, I didn't know it was still in the active. Yeah, that's right. I didn't know it was still under active development. So what what is what is its goals now? Is it just to continue prototyping things that might go into Firefox or is it trying to become its its own complete package? So it's Rust and you know there's all the Rust crates. We had a, a show you can listen to with uh, Martin, who's one of the people on our team who worked on Servo originally and now also works on it again uh, through Egalia and the Linux Foundation. But I, I think those sort of like go in both directions. Uh, So there are people from Mozilla who still contribute. And some of those bits are used by Firefox. And I think there are some bits in Firefox that are still used through Servo as well. And so it's, I think, a little bit symbiotic right now. But like its goal is to become useful as as a thing itself to help keep the development going so there are lots of uses of the web platform that don't have to be exactly feature complete but need to have some characteristic about them that is really useful so like examples of this there's lots of web engines that do something like what you were saying when microsoft like redid and and had a, a new svg that they could show off you know like being really fast at canvas or svg or like having some tweaks like that make you more appealing as like an embedded web engine if you have like more strict needs of what you do and don't need you know so uh, that's one that's one possibility another is to keep it alive as a sort of a research project as it was originally and maybe get built into various sorts of things and very community oriented but yeah it's it's an interesting thing you know we have done a bunch of shows on the novel engines oh i like that time yeah so i think that what we're talking about just a minute ago is though 
part of the reason why well i don't i don't know that this is the case i actually want to ask what you think so you had this like chrome had this shift away to higher level and css and probably but it seems to me like google's investment in css especially has always been really heavy am i do you think i read that wrong because they they've always had somewhere around twice as many members to css working group as any other organization it, it might be that my read's entirely wrong here but i i felt like for a lot of time when i was at google that the css focus was on the houdini stuff like we were going to have hmm. uh well a, a paint workload which which we did get and but then we're going to have an animation workload and we're going to have yeah. like you know you're going to be running code on the compositor and uh, you're going to have a, a layout worklet so you can prototype new kinds of layout, which like sounding great, or you know, or, or some way to hook code into this, you know, CSS selector stuff. Because it basically because polyfilling any CSS feature was uh, just an absolute nightmare, and it just wasn't worth doing aside from as little ex you know, little experiments. It was nothing you would want anywhere near production code, and I think these days. That is still 100% true. And the fact that Chrome isn't pushing on that anymore, as far as I can see, is one of the things where I, I feel it, it switched to a, a little bit higher level. But also felt like I was pushing for page transitions for such a long time and, and was getting pushed back because they weren't low level enough. But then suddenly we, we were allowed to do it. Yeah. Um, and then we're starting to get the see the higher level stuff trickle into service worker land as well i think that's that's where i'm I, i'm seeing that but yeah then there's, there's lots of features that are, are kind of landing in css and i know that's not by any means uh just chrome but it's something that they're happy to chuck a lot of resources at and i think there's a lot of like chrome didn't really have a css devrel for most of the time i was there but now i would say like adam uh yuna and bramus are very heavily leaning towards the CSS side of things. So so that felt like a shift in priorities as well. Yeah, I can, I mean, I can see that. I also see maybe reasons for that. This is what I'm, you know, what I was trying to get at. I would like to ask, like, I also see in that same time frame we got grid. Mm -hmm. um, we got a, a rewrite of the underlying layout engine with mm -hmm. layout ng, which was necessary because we couldn't we didn't have fragmentation primitives which are the basis for all the things that are happening now we got lots of small selectors we got css custom properties in that time so like it seemed like we were still getting a lot of other stuff besides houdini stuff to me and i wonder if a lot of stuff just got unlocked by paying down some of that tech debt and also investment from the outside to take on some of those projects that everybody thought were impossible. <laughs> like mm. CSS grid, we did that in two engines and that seems pretty huge. Has, we're the ones that did the first implementation of that. Uh, that seems pretty huge. We Was grid on... in Chrome, uh, Agalia? Was that, yes. was that you folks? Yes, yeah. yep. I felt for a long time that one of the things, the sort of high level things that Chrome wasn't bothering with was great. Like I, I was a huge fan of the early stuff that appeared in in IE because I I didn't think Flexbox was good enough. But the the message that I was kind of hearing internally and also you know from some other folks as well is that well we've got Flexbox now we don't we don't need Grid and it's like well no it's like Flexbox is one dimensional right <laughs> but there's large parts of the you know large parts of layouts which are not one dimensional. So yeah, I think that that was one of the things where I felt like Chrome wasn't didn't seem to care enough about the, the the high level side, but yeah, that that seems to have changed. But as you say, that might be about like unlocking things by you know improving layout internally and 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 also getting companies like Galia to go and to to do the work. Um, I think Interop also has been huge here. Like it let us align, and you know if you think about it, like in terms of like a dev tools waterfall, the standards process, it's like you know, there's no gaps. We're doing it all in parallel. So like everybody's working on the specs and focusing on the same things at the same time. And so, yeah, it just feels like a lot more productive on some of those CSS things probably too, because, you know, they're not taking four years, seven years, you know, they're taking one or two years to get this major work done, which is, 
really just about parallelism, which is like a topic that Sermo would like. <laughs> <laughs> Can I tell you a story about the Houdini thing really quick? I know we're like way over time. Do it. I want to hear the story. So, um, you know, the reason that I began talking to like Alex and Yehuda and Paul Irish and, you know, like the people that I was talking to about the extensive web was because of the thing that Jake was talking about, which was like, I wanted to do something to like polyfill CSS. And I was like, boy, this is great. Like you can polyfill other things it, like in JavaScript is great. Like you have these mutable prototypes you can polyfill and like basically not even be able to tell the difference for the most part. HTML less so, but like maybe with Shadow DOM, we could come up with something like that. But CSS, just forget about it. Like it was just, you can't. So after we published the Accessible Web Manifesto, I went to the W3C tag and like really lobbied on the mailing list and even went to some of their meetings and was like really kind of put the pressure on and got like Alex to back me up on some things who was on the tag at that point which is like, no, CSS, you don't get to be special. Like you need to explain the magic. You need to have this kind of like layering in, you know, like it doesn't need to be perfect. Do you know what I'm saying? It's just like, there's no escape hatches at mm. all. There's nothing. <laughs> it is exactly the thing that you were saying, which is like, why am I reinventing all this? Like the browser knows how to parse CSS. Like I shouldn't have to write a CSS parser, you know, but that that's basically what you have to do. And you can't, you can't plug into it in the same way because cross-origin stuff and so finally that you know they said there's just not enough resources there's not enough people and uh, finally uh i said look the tag has used in the past task forces you know like mm. doesn't have to be you maybe just like say we're thinking about doing this and seeing if anybody bites and is interested in volunteering you know maybe maybe somebody would uh i would you know uh they created a task force and I don't know it was like somebody at W3C. I felt like they were kind of gaslighting me because the name of it was uh, like WTF, what task force. <laughs> <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, then surprisingly, all these people joined, like all these people joined and um, they were trying to think of a name because that's the first thing you have to do is bike shed the name of your group. And it was going very, very badly. It was like people wanted to name it like FXTFFX or like it was these wild acronyms that were totally meaningless. And uh, mm -hmm. so I said, uh, what about Houdini? Like, here's why. And uh, so that's where we got the name Houdini. And oh, nice. I, oh, I didn't realize I'm, you'd come up with the name. Very good. I'm, uh, no, I did not know this. I am kind of uh, sad about Houdini, and I would like to know what you think about it, because I think we kind of focused on the wrong things, and we burnt all the energy and goodwill without real success, because like I don't know that anybody needs a paint worklet. Like, I don't think that that's the reason that we should have done Houdini, you know? Yeah, I would agree. I think I was always... It's one of the things I look back on a little bit, where I definitely presented publicly more excitement for something than I actually had. Like I, I knew it had this use cases where paint work that was beneficial and helped you, I don't know, reduce the number of DOM nodes in your document to achieve an effect and stuff like that. But the thing I was after was layout worklet. Like that for me was an extensibility primitive. Exactly. That was actually really exactly. valuable. I was also just conceptually really excited about the CSS parser API, which is exactly what Jake was saying, that you could actually start hooking into the parser, not only reuse it, but extend it was the idea. Like what if you could teach the parser about your own at rule and you provide the code exactly do the thing but those mm -hmm. that one didn't even ever get like a draft. Like I don't I think it's literally an empty read me still. I haven't checked in a while, but yeah, like those, the things that made the, that let you hook into the engine properly were great. The original incarnation of layout uh, of animation worklet was also really cool because it was basically supposed to be a piece of JavaScript code that can take anything at input and control any CSS property. It could be scroll position. It could be mm. time. It could be another timeline as input and you can do arbitrary math to set CSS properties or even set scroll position. I think like it was quite the powerful primitive. But for the sake of shipping something, I think there were lots of compromises during standardizations that left us with the a whole redesign and then animation work with that 
allowed effects that were very popular, like a scroll linked effect, but were actually really hard to do right. And so I think it just never really got a lot of excitement. And now we have scroll linked effect. In this case, the, being declarative is probably the better way to go about it. So yeah, I, th I think I would agree with you that the things that were shipped, that were prioritized, were not the things that Houdini was really at the core about. Yeah, I think the parser, media queries, um, custom functions is another one that you could do. Um, mm. there, there's a, a whole list of custom things that are listed uh, in CSS working group drafts that I still would really like to see us do. And we are kind of going back and looking at some of them now, but they're not called Houdini anymore. They're just CSS. So, Do you know where you could define CSS functionality in JavaScript? Internet Explorer 6. Um, Boom. For, yeah, HTC. like for people who've not... Uh, well, H yeah, it's HTC, but there's also the expression uh, CSS function that you could just put JavaScript right. in. Mm. With, with a reference to the element and that bit of JavaScript would run like whenever anything happened on the page. So you move the mouse around that, that little expression would be recalculated time and time again. It was an absolute performance disaster, but Hey, a lovely piece of functionality. I definitely worked around bugs using it before. This was so much fun. We probably need to wrap it up, but, um, just on the way out, I just want to ask in your show which everybody should go listen to uh you closed off with what are your wishes mm. uh, like what what should we focus on if you controlled the money and the levers of power and whatever like what would you like to see i'm highly very influenced by the kinds of things i work on and i've realized that everything i build has a um a static render a worker of some description and a checkered background somewhere. So that's like, you know, Squoosh, which I did some of the front end work on, SVG, OMG, which I'm kind of looking at building the next version of now. And so like kind of influenced by that, the things that I've been wanting for a long time and still aren't there is when I'm creating a pinch zoom component, I want, I wish I could use platform physics, right? I, I wish I could make that pinch zooming feel like the, the official maps app on the platform. Like it, it has mm -hmm. all of the, the drag and and all of that sort of stuff that that feels natural and i still think like communicating with workers is such a pain and i feel there are some really simple solutions there like well Surma um worked on uh well built comlink which is a really nice uh, library for kind of bridging the gap between the main page and workers but i think the platform could just ship a simple version of that like so if you in your worker your module worker export a function you should be able to call that from the other side. And obviously, you know, it would give you a promise for the value and that value would be structure cloned. But, and the whole thing could just be explained using post message and message ports under the hood. But I would just love to see that be so easy. Like, I just want to be able to call a function on the worker I created uh, that I have exported inside the, uh, the source code for the worker. But yeah, maybe I'm thinking just because that's the side projects I'm working on right now. Am, am I wrong? Maybe, maybe Surma, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but like, I feel like it's similar in some ways to like <clears throat> Calm and Corba and things from the early nineties even. Yeah. It's history going full circle. Right. It's really interesting. Yeah. And I, I totally agree. We should do something like that because uh feels like we've been banging back and forth on a pendulum there. Mm -hmm. What about you, Surma? What do you think? Yeah, I think for me, web platform, what it what is it missing? I I feel like we have a couple of primitives lying around and you can all like scoop them together and build really good things like app-like things even with it. But it still doesn't feel necessarily natural. Mm -hmm. If I sometimes look at, you know, you open Android Studio and you start building an app, just like the fact that you can... You know, you, you build up your UI and you attach functionality to your to your UI elements and derive the next screen from a certain state object in a way that adapts to multiple devices fairly easily. It's like, yes, the web can do that as well, but it's definitely not as easy. And there's a couple of things that are quite easy to hook into on Android that is very hard on the web. And it's, it's the thing like Jake said, like the platform physics or you want to have a custom layout without trashing your entire page's performance, or you want to intercept certain input events. And yeah, I just want more of that to be exposed. I want, basically, I think what I'm saying is that I just want browser engines to be 
more modular and, and just allow me to replace certain parts of them with my own code if and when I want to. That would really give us the most flexibility to use reuse most of the code that browsers have and only ship the code where we need special behavior. Because the alternative currently is where you know, like it's the this movement of you write your web apps in Rust with your custom web GPU renderer, which Yes, ultimate flexibility, but also 19 megabytes of WASM to get <laughs> right. square on screen. So, like, it's I, I I would love for us to find the 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 middle ground where the browser has so much code, so much good battle tested flexible code, and just many parts are not accessible to be reused, um, and allow you to to build more things. Yeah, I think we need some stuff in the middle. Hey, thanks so much for coming on and, and humoring my <laughs> invitation to come and chat on about these things. I had a really good time. Oh, me too. Thanks me so too. much for having us. Yeah. Where can people find the Off the Main Thread podcast? Hopefully wherever people already get their other podcasts. If not, let us know, but it's Off the Main Thread. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Spotify. It's on Deezer, on Amazon. Is it on Google Podcasts? Oh, wait, that's gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, another dead rock. If you don't know where to find it, off the main thread .tech is the website where there's links to all of them and also a, a, a custom built player by the two of us. Mm. Awesome. Okay, very nice. And where can people find each of you individually on the interwebs? Uh, on the various socials. Yeah. We have links to the Twitters on uh, on the off the main thread .tech, so people can find us there. Mm. And then, you know, you kind of play, grab the rope and just swing through all the interviews to find the other ones. They're all linked from one way or another. So that that's probably the starting point off yeah. the main thread .tech. Okay. Awesome. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Cheers.